Damon. This is VOA One, The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Novak. And I'm Dan Friedel. This program is designed for English learners. So we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Coming up on the program, I report on how Mexican students will be able to pay less to attend California community colleges. Brian Lynn reports on how climate change is affecting pollinating insects. And Jill Robbins has a story on the hottest pepper in the world. Dan Novak has this week's education story on a UN report that argues education technology should be used more carefully. Later, John Russell presents the English lesson of the day. But first... California Governor Gavin Newsom signed a law last week permitting low-income Mexican students to pay the same cost as Californians to attend some community colleges. The law starts next year and will run as a pilot or test program for five years. The program is open to Mexican students who live within 72 kilometers of the U.S. border in California. In California, the Education Data Initiative says the average yearly cost of tuition at community colleges for Californians is $1,500. For out-of-state students, the yearly cost is nearly $10,000. It means a possible savings of more than $8,000 for some Mexican students under the program. David Alvarez is a California state lawmaker who worked on the law. He said many Mexicans travel between the two countries to work or visit family, and the law will help make education readily available to prepare them for jobs. Alvarez said in a statement that the program would help prepare a more diverse population among our workforce. Southwestern College in Chula Vista, California, is just 11 kilometers from the U.S. border with Mexico. The college's president, Mark Sanchez, said many students at the school split their time between the two countries. Without this pilot, we risk everything in terms of loss of talent, he told lawmakers at a hearing last June. Students from Mexico who decide to go to Southwestern College will save about $7,000 based on the lower cost for Californians. The law requires community colleges to report by 2028 on the attendance and the number of students receiving in-state tuition under the program. In 2015, California passed a similar law that permitted students who lived close to its border with Nevada to attend Lake Tahoe Community College at in-state tuition. A new study suggests changes in world climate and land use are sharply reducing the number of insects needed for pollinating crops. The study looked at thousands of species and areas around the world. It found that the number of pollinating insects dropped by 61% during periods of abnormally high temperatures and reduced supply of flowering plants. 
leaders of the study noted that bees, flies, moths, and other pollinators are more affected than the general insect population. Results of the research recently appeared in the publication Science Advances. We're seeing the climate change is already having this really strong impact on pollinators, study co-writer Tim Newbald told the Associated Press. He is an ecologist at the University College of London. The U.S. Department of Agriculture estimates about 35% of world food crops and 75% of flowering plants depend on insects and other animal pollinators to reproduce. The study found the biggest problems with pollinator loss are in the tropics, areas that sit close to Earth's equator. The countries most at risk of crop loss from reduced pollinators include China, India, Indonesia, and Brazil. Sub-Saharan Africa is also in danger, especially its cocoa and mango crops, the study found. Given the current situation, the researchers said some important tropical crops, especially coffee and cocoa, could be badly hurt. Those plants depend heavily on bees and flies to help them reproduce. Past studies have shown insect populations are decreasing for several reasons, including climate change and loss of habitat. Other studies have shown shrinking numbers of pollinators with coffee and cocoa plants especially harmed by the absence. Newbold from the University College of London said he sees a double hit of climate change affecting the coffee plants themselves as well as the pollinators they depend on. This does not mean, however, that there will be no coffee or chocolate available, said the study's lead writer, Joe Millard. It will just mean buyers will have to pay more for them. Millard is a computational ecologist at the Natural History Museum in London. University of Delaware insect expert Douglas Ptolemy, who was not part of the research, said this study is unusual because it's centered on the tropics, which other research has not. We're not paying enough attention to the tropics, Ptolemy said. They are important. Newbold noted that pollinating insects in the tropics are likely hit harder than other places because they are already near their temperature limits that place them at risk. Massive warming in the tropics is pushing those species over the edge, Newbold said. Habitat loss is the main driver for the shrinking number of pollinators because it leaves less food for them, Millard said. Climate change, parasites, disease, and chemicals in the environment add to that difficulty. Newbold said scientists are still trying to find out why pollinators seem to be suffering worse effects from warming temperatures than other insects. It could be because they have hairier legs and bodies that help them carry pollen, the researchers said. It is like being forced to have a big furry coat and it's getting hot, Newbold said. I'm Brian Lynn.
Ed Curry is the pepper expert who grew the Carolina Reaper, which has been considered the hottest pepper in the world since 2013. Ten years later, Curry broke his record with one that is three times hotter, Pepper X. The Guinness Book of World Records named Curry's latest creation the world's hottest chili pepper this month. Guinness uses what are called Scoville Heat Units, or SHU, to measure heat in a chili pepper. A normal jalapeno pepper registers about 5,000 units. A habanero, the record holder about 25 years ago, reaches 100,000 SHU. The Carolina Reaper held the record since 2013 with 1.64 million SHU. And Pepper X is the new record holder with an average of 2.69 million units. By comparison, pepper spray, commonly carried by police, is around 1.6 million units. And bear spray, a product to keep bears away, is advertised to have 2.2 million units. Curry said when he first tried Pepper X, I was feeling the heat for three and a half hours. Curry, one of only five people so far to eat an entire Pepper X, added, Then the cramps came. The cramps, he said, left him lying in pain for another hour. Curry started working on Pepper X after he set the record in 2013 with the Carolina Reaper. He crossbred 100 different kinds of peppers every year for 10 years. Curry hoped that just one or two would make it through the development process. His goal was to offer an extremely hot pepper flavored with a little sweetness. Pepper X is greenish-yellow. It is a crossbreed of a Carolina Reaper and what Curry mysteriously called a pepper that a friend of mine sent me from Michigan that was brutally hot. The chemical in peppers that causes the burn is called capsaicin. The chemical causes a burning sensation when it touches human tissue. The burning sensation is also said to release chemicals into the body called endorphins and dopamine. Curry started growing peppers after ending drug and alcohol addictions. He considers that sensation a natural high. He shares his peppers with medical researchers, hoping they can use them to treat disease and help people who suffer chronic pain or discomfort. Curry is trying to build a business with his new creation. In the past, Curry permitted people to grow his peppers without protecting his ideas. His lawyers say they have counted more than 10,000 products that use the Carolina Reaper name or other intellectual property without permission. For Pepper X, he said no seeds will be released without his permission. Everybody else made their money off the reaper. It's time for us to reap the benefits of the hard work I do, Curry said. I'm Jill Robbins. The COVID-19 pandemic showed how useful digital technology could be for schools. But it also showed the limitations of technology in the educational setting. Millions of students were able to attend classes online to avoid spreading the virus. But many students failed to learn by such methods. Their educational progress slowed and in some cases went backwards. Digital tools and the Internet 
have made it easier for students to access educational resources. However, a large number of schools around the world remain unconnected to the internet. Additionally. Digital tools have entered markets that have no official supervision. Such educational products do not require any testing or proof as to their value to schools and learners. The United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, or UNESCO, argues against unsupervised wide use of digital tools and AI in education. A recent UNESCO report says there is little evidence that wide technology use improves learning. The organization says digital educational tools can never replace the human connection of teacher and student. Audrey Azoulé is UNESCO's director general. She says there is a very large divide. Or gap between rich and poor countries when it comes to digital resources. Just forty percent of primary schools worldwide have access to the internet, she said. Many schools also lack electricity, especially in Africa and Central and Southern Asia. In Sub-Saharan Africa, just thirty-two percent of schools have electricity. And internationally, about one third of students were unable to attend online classes during the pandemic. Even if connectivity was universal, it would still be necessary to demonstrate that digital technology offers real added value in terms of effective learning. The report says. Often. Technology changes faster than it is possible to study it, the report says. Educational technology products change every three years on average. In Britain, for example, just seven percent of educational technology companies had done studies to judge the effectiveness of their products. UNESCO also reported. That many companies pay for studies on the effectiveness of their own product. These studies are not independent examinations. Pearson, an education technology company, has a tool called Success Maker for teaching math and reading. Independent studies show the tool has little or negative effectiveness in learning. But the company stands by the results of the private study it paid for. That study found the product very helpful for learning. UNESCO says such companies need to be better regulated. Azale said just 14 percent of countries require data protection in education. Student data should not be used by education technology or advertising technology companies for marketing purposes, the report says. Yet a study of 163 products found that 89 percent of them gathered student data and sent them to third-party companies, often for advertising purposes. This usually happened without the student or parent knowing, the study said. UNESCO argues that technology holds great possibilities for education, but studies have shown that educational technologies are most effective when a teacher is involved in the instructional process. We must never forget the social and emotional dimensions of teaching and learning, Azale said, adding, "No screen will ever replace a teacher." I'm Dan Novak. Was Dan Novak with this week's education report? Dan joins me now to talk more about the story. Thanks for coming on the show, Dan. Thanks for having me. There was one word in the story that I was hoping you could explain to our listeners. 
It's regulation. Sure, regulate is the verb, and it means to control or maintain something. So you could regulate the temperature in your house, for example. But the word is often used in relation to the government. Government regulation refers to the rules and laws that the government places on businesses so they can operate. We can also refer to this as government oversight. In the story, you mentioned that UNESCO is calling for education technology companies to be more regulated. Why is that? UNESCO notes in its long report about education technology that there is little evidence that these products actually improve learning. Independent studies of some products show that they are ineffective, which goes against studies that are funded by the companies themselves. So, one possible way the businesses could be regulated is to require them to show effectiveness of their products in an independent study. Governments could also limit the amount of technology in schools, and that's happening in Sweden right now. Well, Dan, I guess Swedish schools. Should hang on to their papers and pencils for now. Thanks again for joining me, Dan. You're welcome. See you next time. In this next report, Mario Ritter Jr. tells us about a new kind of Chinese submarine. We learn that the new submarine will be more difficult to detect. Pay careful attention to the word nightmare. We will talk about it after the report. China is developing a new generation of nuclear-armed submarines that experts say will be more difficult for the United States and its allies to find. The new submarines, known as Type Zero Nine Six, will be quiet, aided in part by Russian technology. Military experts expect them to be ready within ten years. Researchers met at the U.S. Naval War College and published their findings on the submarines in August. The Type Zero Nine Sixes are going to be a nightmare," said Christopher Carlson, one of the researchers. "They are going to be very, very hard to detect." The Chinese Navy. Has regularly sent nuclear-armed submarines out of Hainan Island in the South China Sea. However, the older Type Zero Nine Four boats are noisy. That is a major problem for military submarines. The research paper noted that the new Type Zero Nine Six submarine will be similar to Russian submarines. In terms of stealth, sensing equipment, and weapons, the findings are based partly on Chinese military publications, speeches by senior military officers, and other information. Satellite images taken in November of China's new Huludao Shipbuilding Center. Show parts of a large submarine being built. The report said the boats are expected to be operational by 2030. The new submarine is likely to be much larger than Type 094. The design, based on Russian technology, enables the submarine to contain a raft. Attached to a complex rubber support system to reduce engine noise. Neither the Russian nor the Chinese defense ministries answered Reuters' requests for comment. Carlson told Reuters he did not believe China had gained the latest Russian submarine technology. But China would be able to produce a submarine stealthy enough to compare to Russia's Akula boats. We have a hard time finding and tracking the improved Akulas as it is, Carlson said. Military experts say the tracking of Chinese submarines is increasingly an international effort. 
both the Japanese and Indian militaries have aided the United States, Australia, and Britain. The countries have increased anti-submarine warfare exercises and deployed submarine hunting aircraft around Southeast Asia and the Indian Ocean. The possibility of more modern and quiet Chinese submarines partly led to a deal between Australia, Britain, and the U.S. The agreement calls for British and U.S. attack submarines to be deployed in Western Australia. By the 2030s, Australia expects to launch its first nuclear-powered attack submarines with British technology. Vasily Kashin is a Chinese military expert based in Moscow at HSE University. He said Chinese engineers might have made the improvements described in the report. Kashin said there was no known sharing agreement between China and Russia outside of a 2010 agreement related to nuclear reactors. He believed that China likely gained important Russian technology in the 1990s after the breakup of the Soviet Union. China is not an adversary of Russia in the naval field, Kashin said. It is not creating difficulties for us, it is creating problems for the U.S. I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. Before the report, we asked you to pay careful attention to the word nightmare. Can you remember when you heard it? You heard it in a quote from Christopher Carlson, a researcher. Let's listen again. Researchers met at the U.S. Naval War College and published their findings on the submarines in August. The Type 096s are going to be a nightmare, said Christopher Carlson, one of the researchers. They are going to be very, very hard to detect. The word nightmare is a noun. The online etymology dictionary tells us the word dates to around 1300 and originally was used to describe an evil spirit that came to men or horses in their sleep. Over time, it slowly took on the meaning of any bad dream. By around the 1830s, it came to also mean a very bad experience. Google Ngram Viewer suggests the short word a uh, is the most commonly used word with nightmare. So you are more likely to hear or read the structure a nightmare than you are to hear other structures such as the nightmare, this nightmare, and so on. You might hear a person describe an experience, event, or even competition, as a nightmare. In the case of our quote, a technological development could be the source of a nightmare in a competition between large countries, namely the U.S. and China. Let's take an example from a different kind of competition, sports. You might hear a news report about a football game. A top player on one team can be described as a nightmare for the other team. In this sense, nightmare means that the top player is talented and difficult to deal with. And that's the lesson of the day. I'm John Russell. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Dan Novak. And I'm Dan Friedel.